The West Coast Conference Commissioner, at least for a little bit longer, before he transitions over to the Pac-12 as the new Deputy Commissioner and COO, his name is Jamie Zaninovich. Jamie, congratulations, first of yeah, all, congrats. on the new job with the Pac-12. Thanks, guys. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity for me, but honestly a little bittersweet, too. So um, we have a great membership here at the West Coast Conference, and I know they'll They'll do great things once I get out of the way here. So, um, <laughs> But uh, thanks. I appreciate that. Well, it was great talking to you, Jamie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have a nice life. Uh, fittingly, BYU, a West Coast Conference team, and technically you're still the man in charge of the WCC until the transition takes place. They matched up with a Pac-12 foe, Oregon. It's about to get awkward. Who you got, the Cougars or Ducks? <laughs> well, since I don't start at the Pac-12 uh, until July... Uh, I certainly wouldn't predict who's going to win, but uh, but my heart for now will be with the Cougars. Yeah, there you go. Yes. He's I a WCC pre- man. Yes, I appreciate for that. <laughs> West Coast Conference Commissioner Jamie Zaninovich, uh, a guy who just took a job recently and will move over to the Pac-12 in July, is on BYU Sports Nation. BYU is such a hot topic. They've become kind of a polarizing team because uh, there's a ton of analysts that are taking sides on whether BYU deserved to be in. As we saw it, and as the committee broke it down, they they weren't just barely in; they were way in. Why was BYU kind of an at-large lock, according to the committee? Well, I can answer that question better if I was actually in the room for any of the discussions about BYU. Yeah, but yeah. As, as you guys know, our rules appropriately so dictate that I'm not part of those conversations. So I can only speculate based on some of the principles that were applied. But I I do think that BYU's schedule. Not only their non-conference schedule, but the fact that our the, the West Coast Conference had as strong years we've ever had, um, I think probably helped them. So you know some of the close losses and good wins uh, were very strong, and then some of the quote-unquote bad losses because as a, we as a conference, West Coast Conference had a better year top to bottom than we've ever had, probably weren't as um, as uh, sort of impactful as maybe they were in the past. So. Uh, my guess is is that's why, but certainly, you know, when it comes down to the last selections of the couple last selections, sort of um, the strength of a schedule, non-conference otherwise, is um, at least in the three years I've been on the committee, it's been a very a very strong factor. Was that the most stressful day of your life? Was that the most stressful day? Uh, which day? We were there for five of them. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most stressful day? Uh, probably Saturday. Okay. Um, you know, Saturday is when we actually completed the the bracket and had an initial initial seed list, or sorry, completed the selections and had an initial seed list one to sixty eight. Um, so we, uh, you know, Saturday was a long day because you're you're working on selections, but you're also waiting for a lot of games to end that could impact those. So Saturday always ends up being a late night. Um, and we make sure that we plan for it, but that's probably Saturday's probably the most grueling day. Sunday is generally more focused on bracketing. Jamie Zaninovich, West Coast Conference Commissioner, headed to the Pac-12 to be the Deputy Commissioner and COO uh, in July on BYU Sports Nation. He just wrapped up another successful campaign with the NCAA Tournament Committee. BYU, of course, you're not in those discussions specifically, but you have to deal with things like Sunday play when it comes to where, where they fit in. Uh, how much does that affect their seating, and how much of a headache is that for the committee when they're putting the team like BYU in? Well, it certainly um, didn't affect their seating because for those of you that follow, that follow this really closely, um, we changed some of our bracketing rules this year to to assure that we didn't move anyone off a seed list when we went to the bracketing, um, and that came from in-depth discussions with the NABC board, the basketball coaches, and others. So we were able, for the first time in a long time, to actually make a bracket without – um, moving anyone off the seed line. Huh. That be- I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I said, no, that's, that's, that's just great insight. That being said, um, BYU complicates things significantly. Uh, it's actually very challenging because once you get to the 10 line, BYU has to be obviously in a region that is uh, not only a Thursday, Saturday, second and third round, but a Thursday, Saturday regional play round. So that really constrains what you do as you go through the bracket and, and select teams. It would be less of an issue, honestly, if and when uh, BYU is a top four seed, because those top four seeds tend to be protected regionally, and they sort of get the first pick of where they play based on what's available, starting with the overall one seed and going down to the last of the of the four seeds. 
Um, but in the case of BYU being outside those four, then you're sort of at the mercy of how those have been set earlier in the bracketing process. And so when BYU's name comes up, you're very much constrained in terms of, of where they can go. And um, But with our new bracketing principles, and otherwise we're able to, to accommodate that and uh, not um, – compromise anything else. I mean, honestly, that was a big reason why BYU has a game against Oregon, which is a replay game, which we normally would try to avoid. There was just no possible way to avoid that replay game and still uh, accommodate the needs of the bracketing principles and specifically BYU situation. Jamie Zaninovich, the West Coast Conference Commissioner, is on BYU Sports Nation. I know that the process is lengthy, uh, I'm guessing complicated, and uh, you guys do a really thorough job of it. Can you summarize uh, simply, if that's even possible, what uh, what you do to make the bracket? It's really very highly automated. Um, there's a staff member, Colin, in the NCAA office who is a, a, an absolute savant related to some of these software programs. And basically, we take the seed list. Uh, we have a computer program that, starting with the one seed, we start placing into the bracket based on what their seat is and um, what region they'd be in. There's all sorts of bracketing principles related to the first. If you're one of the top 16 seeds, or, or one of the top 16, being meaning one of the top four seeds in each of the regions, that the first four from any conference have to be in separate regions. Uh, and then there's principles related to how early you can meet a team in your own conference in the bracket. Those things all come up automatically on the computer screen for us as we start bracketing across in case we're compromising a principle. So you literally just start with number one. So, you know, if you saw the seed list, Florida was a number one seed. So we'd say, okay, number one, Florida, where should they go? And we'll know that from a geography standpoint, um, the South and Memphis is the closest regional site, so we know they're going to be in Memphis, so we put them there, and then we just keep going one, two, three, four, all the way down to 16, so we see we get the four, the four, first four seeds in each region, the top 16 in the region they go to. Then we start putting in second and third round sites, so we go back again and say, okay, Florida was the number one. They're in the south in Memphis. What are the available second and third round sites? Orlando, that's closest to home for them. We put Florida in Orlando, and we just keep going down until we have those for the top 16. Then we'll go back and start with the five seeds, and we'll go along and do the same thing, making sure that we're not compromising any bracketing principles related to when they play teams or who they play or how many teams from their conference or in a region. And um, assuming that those bracketing principles are, are achieved, then we will give them an opportunity to play as close to home as possible. The emphasis on, on placing those teams regionally is a fantastic thing for college basketball. It, not, not that the NCAA tournament needs more excitement, but it, it gets those fans out to see their teams. And, and if you haven't experienced the NCAA tournament in person, there's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like watching those first and second round games on the opening day because, I mean, it's, it's one of the best sports memories I've ever had, and it dealt with uh, a lot of the, the fans being able to go and watch their favorite teams. Yeah, it is important, but it's not – more important than making sure that we maintain within reason uh, the best competitive equity we can. So you're always balancing those principles. Absolutely. But but certainly, you know, listen, if you have a great season and you maintain or, or receive, because you're worthy of it, a top seed, there should be some advantage to that. You know, it's no different than than a, a top seed and, and matchups in a conference tournament. So, you know, the fact that Florida was the number one overall seed, they earn the right to play both in the second and third round in the region as close to home as possible. So, you know, and then you just sort of waterfall it from there. Injuries uh, have been discussed and how that affects seeding. Joel Embiid with Kansas, Kyle Collinsworth with BYU among the notable ones. Uh, what kind of conversation was there about those uh, with the committee? Well, again, I wasn't part of the, any of the injuries related to Kyle Collinsworth. I think, uh, you know, certainly the injuries are um, talked about. They have to be talked about, and we'll literally go on a game-by-game basis and know what players were available at what times. But, you know, those teams also still played with five players. Right. Uh, it's not like if Marcus Smart or Joel Embiid weren't on the court, those teams were playing five on four. So in some respects, it's not fair to the other teams that play them and potentially beat them. and So you, you can't go that deep on it. I think the injuries inform what we do. I would say that they probably have more of an effect um, on the margin on seeding discussions than selection discussions, but um, but certainly they're, they're known in the seeding discussions as well. And Kansas wasn't penalized for the injury, it appeared. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Well, you have to keep in mind that um, if you look at the overall seed list, um, 
you know, the, the you can tell who sort of who was the number one, two, or the number you know back in the back of the two line because there's four teams there. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think the Embiid injury is one somewhat ambiguous. We don't know exactly what it is, except we know he's not going to play for two games. But you know, I think there was a body of work there, both with and without Joel Embiid for Kansas. I mean, you're talking a team that I think had 13 top 50 wins. Um, that was pretty remarkable. That still, I think, solidified their their position with or without him. Um, you know, in in those upper two lines. Fair enough. That was refreshing to see, and a precedent that I was glad to see the committee set. And that is that we will reward you for what you have done. We're not going to re- we're not going to seed you, projecting what we think you will be if this certain player isn't there. So I I thought that was really really interesting, and and uh, certainly a fresh perspective from the committee. Jamie Zaninovich joining BYU Sports Nation. Jamie, the West Coast Conference had a banner year, I believe, for the first time since 1989 between the. NCAA tourney and the NIT, they have four teams in. What do you attribute that to? Oh, I just think we have programs that are that are continuing to build and we're as deep as I think we've ever been. And we talked about this in our tournament when, when we sat down and, and chatted about yeah. the strength of the league. I think top to bottom, it's the best I've seen it. And it was nice to, to be rewarded for that, both in the NCAA and in the NIT. NITs, you know, there are very limited spots in that tournament now. They have automatic qualifiers for all the conference champions that win that don't go through their tournament and make the NCAA. So there's very few spots there, probably, you know, 13 to 15 spots that are available. And for two of our schools to occupy those in competition with, with, you know, a lot of really strong programs with, you know, really high-profile national brands um, was, I think, great for us. And I think those are great opportunities for St. Mary's and, and USF. And certainly on the NCAA side, it's always our goal to be multiple bid. Um, and you know there aren't many many conferences that do that with the, with the way realignment has worked. So for us to be in that conversation is certainly a positive thing going forward. Let's finish with this, Jamie. When will the WCC name a new commissioner in your place? Well, I can't really speak to that because I'm not uh, heading up the search. That'll be the president's, obviously. <laughs> um, all I know is that I'm committed here through June through our summer executive committee and president's council meetings. Um, and so between now and then, um, the presidents will put a process in place and, um, and, and figure out sort of who will, uh, who will be the next person here, and uh, that's probably a better question for them than it is for me. Jamie, we appreciate the insight and the clarity. Uh, you've been great to work with. We wish you the best as you move forward, and uh, we certainly enjoyed having you as the West Coast Conference Commissioner. Thanks, guys. Good luck to you. New show seems to be going, going well, and um, good luck to the Cougs this week. Thanks, Thanks so Jamie. much. Thank <laughs> you.